when there is a step change in density in time or in, in the neighborhood, the kind of thing that we see in Vancouver where the boundary between low-rise, low-density single-family homes and super high-rise town center is kind of moving out from the center. You can actually track it block by block. And that, in a, in, in a slightly less dramatic way, is what we're seeing now happening across London with high-density new development. Uh, across much of, especially the eastern half of London, and also along the river in Wembley uh, and over Transport Road. So we're going to hear three very interesting um, presentations about different aspects of that tonight and then have a discussion. Let me just tell you who's going to be talking. First we'll hear from Tom Sykes. Tom is an architectural designer who lives, works, and teaches in London and Cardiff. And he's currently Senior Design and Quality Manager for Transport for London. And he is a public practice alumni. He has a Master's in Architecture from Cardiff University, and his architectural focus is on the way that people inhabit and occupy the world around them, and especially the way that architecture can suggest interaction and play, and resist the perpetual danger of tidying the city. Well, little danger of that in parts of London. Um, then, Sri Sudhakar and Lucia Serrado Morato from Tower Hamlet will present together. Sri is an architect, urban designer, and urban planning professional uh, with over 17 years' experience in public realm projects, regeneration, town center development frameworks, and master plan. She currently has the regeneration, uh, as, excuse me, she's currently the head of regeneration at the London Borough of Tower Hamlet. And responsible for delivery of design and conservation services in Nevada. And those who know Tower Hamlets will know that it is really at the epicenter of gentrification in, in London. Lucia is an architect and planner, currently working as a public practice associate at Tower Hamlets. She has an architecture degree from the Higher Technical School of Architecture in Madrid and a PhD in urban planning from the Bartlett. And finally, Castellet and Edelsor, from Queen Mary, is a cultural geographer who is interested in urban design and planning practices in everyday life. Uh, he looks specifically at the life of residents in cities, and especially in London. Through his research, he looks at how everyday practices, routines, and sensory experiences are conditioned by the way the built environment is given shape through urban design and planning, and especially lighting design and landscape. Right, so Tom, Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Tom Sykes. I'm uh, the, the Senior Design and Quality... Oh, is this... Does that help? Okay, I'm going to stand weirdly. Okay. Turn it off, turn it off, turn it all off. We'll give it a we'll give it a try.
Cool. Thanks. Cool. So I'm, I'm, I work for Transport for London. I'm in their property development team, um, and I'm also an alumni of the public practice program. Um, does everyone know what public practice is? Does anyone not know what public practice is? A couple of people. Great. Okay, well, really quickly tell you what public practice is. So public practice is a social enterprise that takes uh, designers, architects, uh, urbanists, planners from the private sector and places them in the public sector in roles that often are new roles that sit between departments to try and, uh, I don't know, try and add some, some new thinking or try and support thinking that's already started. Um, so I, I applied to public practice out of architectural practice and found myself at Transport for London. Um, in the property development team, which has this, well, in the middle of this is London. This is our measles diagram of all of the sites that Transport for London knows it owns um, within London. And our team is tasked with delivering housing and mixed-use schemes on these sites. Um, our initial target is to have 10,000 homes starting on site by March 2021. And then beyond that, there are some really big, juicy ones. Um, what I wanted to do is come at this from the point of view of, or the focus on too fast. Um, I think the too much is a really difficult question, but there are enormous housing problems, and so we, we do need that housing. For me, in my job, it's a question of how we can get there in the best possible way. Um, so I wanted to start by thinking about the process, uh, how speed in, the partic in particular places can be uncomfortable and how we could try and make that better. So maybe people feel that um, in this kind of behind closed door bit, they, they get an impression that there's a lot of time spent there and then hardly any time spent out talking to people at planning. Then suddenly construction ruins their life forever and then that life bit, well, no one's fucking thought about it. What we really like it to be is for that back room to feel like that door was always open, that there's quite a good conversation all the way up to planning, that the construction is managed in a way that doesn't really ruin everything, and that actually, yeah, the life is meant to be messy. We don't quite know how it's going to go, but we would like to know that our schemes have the kind of resilience or capacity to kind of withstand change like that. So to talk about this really quickly, I want to talk about the approach of our team, which is focusing on this idea of a polycentric city. And then I'll give you three examples of projects of ours and then look back at the process again. And at the, at the heart of this, is it, it is, it's a GLA policy or, or idea, this good growth by design. It's really easy to end up with growth. The, the good bit's quite hard and the design bit's really difficult as well. And getting it all together is, is quite a challenge. So we started, obviously, uh, I mean, know this image, the kind of idea of London getting a bit more interesting. Um, and, I, you know, I imagine by the time you get scrambled eggs, there's salt and pepper and a bit of cayenne in there. Um, it's sort of described as a city of villages, and that's becoming untrue. It's maybe becoming a city of towns. It's probably going to end up being a city of cities. Um, so we started there, and we set up an exhibition with New London Architecture to look at this idea of a polycentric city, how London can evolve towards that. Um, we did quite a lot of research, we did outreach, we did charrettes, and one of the key things that came back, it seems really obvious, but it was quite a nice surprise to some people, was that if you're going to transform an area, it really has to respond to what's already there. You can't just tell a new story, you have to continue an old one. So. Looking at three examples, the first one is, is the classic for us, the suburban transport hub. Um, our kind of easy starts when we looked across our land were our car parks. There's a, a beautiful station in the middle of a town centre, and on either side of it is this kind of sea of, someone's nodding delightfully at the back, sea of car parks. And they're not always that well used. We did quite a lot of parking surveys to test this. Um, this is Arnos Grove. It's a Charles Holden station uh, on the Piccadilly line. It's an absolute gem. It's, it's a really beautiful building. Um, in the 1930s, there are these wonderful drawings of it, you know, the construction drawings and Holden sketches of this sort of clear modern landscape with this building rising up, holding what was at that time a very, very quiet suburb, sort of waiting for, for density to arrive. Unfortunately, it's now kind of cluttered. There's bus stands, there's stuff all over the pavement. The wall that, like, 
the wall that runs around here is all listed as well, but you kind of lose it behind all of the other stuff that's arrived. Um, look at it, there it is, what a gem. Um, so for us, we see these stations, they, they, were, they were reaching out into suburbia, this promise of Metroland as these new, these new centers for life. And these buildings sit kind of in the heart of that community. Um, so we're working with McCrane and Lavington Architects, and we're in a partnership with Granger to deliver um, private rental sets of homes on this site. The key things for us are that we want to revitalize a station square. So we encourage people to use more sustainable modes of transport by reducing and closing the car park. And then put a square out front that is an open space that brings people through it. And then as you work your way back down the site, it does get a bit messier, but it's got that suburban feel of being green, of being quite open to the sky and having active fronts that are domestic around the sides. The other type of density that we kind of, well, you know, we worry about density and, and the problems that can come with it, um, overlooking, overshadowing, too much. this isn't a TFL scheme, um, <laughs> nor is this. Um, but the thing is that density at, at really high densities can be really delightful. They can be the bits that people want to live near. But people really like living in the central parts of London where it's very dense. And actually, you can bring some of those qualities further out. Just got to be quite careful about it. So we started looking at precedents. Like this is, this is Peter Barber Architects looking at back-to-back -back housing. This is now built in Newham. Um, reinvigorating that typology, getting a really dense grain on that site um, and basing it around streets and around courtyards and around a kind of gregarious communality. And all of these homes went on the first day that they were able to be let. They looked kind of strange, but they were very attractive. So we've started working with Peter Barber on a couple of sites. This is a site which has just started um, construction now up um, on the North Circular. Um, it's called Beechwood Muse. What's interesting about this site and the type of density is that when TfL first did a feasibility study for this site, so looking at the land that kind of runs around like that, the feasibility study thought we could get three medium-sized blocks, eight flats per quarter floor, uh, here, here, and here, and that they couldn't really get much on here, they couldn't really get much on there. It was a feasibility study, it wasn't going to solve everything, but it only got around 50 homes on it. This scheme has 97 homes, and it makes a street down the middle, and it feels completely in keeping with that context and that scale. So the third case study is looking at a slightly bigger type of uh, project. And it's that, it's, it's that Lena Bobardi thing about, the, about housing, that, that housing is everything that a city needs. It's the schools, it's the surgeries. Um, it's, it's the kind of intensification and, and density that brings all of the city with it and makes it a place to live. So this is, uh, this is us in partnership with, with Barrett's London and RMA Architects at Black Horse Road. There was a master plan for this site and or for actually several sites all around the station and, and this one sort of sits in the middle. Again, it was a, a huge underused car park. Now it's got active frontages around all of the sides of new streets have been put in. And it's trying to make moments of, of generosity on what is a, quite a constrained site that has, has to provide a large amount of housing. So it's set around these two interconnected courtyard gardens that are then accessible from the street at both sides, not by a kind of narrow stair, but by something sort of eight meters wide that, that's planted all the way up. They're, they're quite challenging schemes to do, but it's finding those moments of generosity. Those feel like the important parts for us. So the way that we've been trying to refine how we work is, is to start to use a set of principles. Um, these are classic TFL posters, but there's a, sort of, there's a, there's a graphic quality to them. Um, in, when we were extending the Jubilee Line extension, I love doing this we, I'm really sorry, I was nowhere near it, but when TFL <laughs> extended the Jubilee Line, Roland Paletti was the chief architect, and he laid down six design principles for all of these projects. One of these is make the most use of natural light, which is a really, really lovely, obvious design principle, but for an underground station, it's quite a weird one, and it means you get southern. Um Another was, um, was dignify everyday commuting, 
And again, like, God, what a challenge. Being that design team where your client's saying to you over a set of drawings, I don't think this dignifies the everyday commute. Like, that's a pretty brutal challenge, but it's going to send you away and make you come back and do something better. So with our new challenge of this, these mixed-use schemes, we started to try and do the, the same thing, identify two overarching values, and then break those into six development principles that you could use as questions. Um, so the two values that we're really looking at, and they're quite obvious, they're a little bit motherhood and apple pie, but in a funny way, if you don't say them out loud, then people kind of forget them. But we're acting as long-term stewards of, of public assets, and that people do have to be at the heart of development. So these break down, and I, I'll, I'll walk through them quite quickly, but the six principles are that our developments will be purposeful, generous, and curated places, that they'll relate to and respond to their neighborhoods, There'll be places that evolve over time. Places that people are proud to live in. They'll celebrate the qualities of urban living. And they'll be founded on transparent engagement and best practice. So within those, there's actually, there's quite a lot of stuff for me and my team to use. And there's a lot of teeth there for a development manager to use with his design team or in a conversation with planners, but equally for a design team to use in conversation with a more commercial mind. So the way that we've laid these out is a set of layers. So you start with the headline principle. This is a booklet. This, this one page can be read in its abstract form. And then those four questions there are the kind of headline questions that anyone, you don't need to know anything about design. If you just sit in your design team meeting and say, has the scheme been designed from from the street first, and whatever your architect says, you say, I just, I don't think that's good enough. Uh, you'll end up with a really nice scheme, I reckon. Um, so then we take it through to a sort of a slightly deeper level, a little bit more explanation. So this might be for the people who aren't quite sure what it means. And we identify a few bits and pieces of work that you might do in order to demonstrate that you're answering that question well. And then, because they like another kind of drawing, we started to set these out as these kind of imaginary, slightly metaphorical schemes where all this information is somehow palmed in there. Um, and that they work from the scale of the scheme and then encourage people to think all the way down into the scale of an apartment or someone turning up for the first time and what their impression of that place really is. To support this, we also work with Design Review. Um, we have a set up with the Merrill Design Advocates where we look at schemes at three stages. It's a kind of internal checking process and it all happens before we go to planning. So the first stage is phase is right at the development concept, trying to make sure that we've got a series of design principles that work for that site. The second one is we often partner with developers, so we ask for bids, cool, um, bids from them and we assess those tenders with the Merrill Design Advocates. And the third is before it gets out to the local authority. I think those, th this process really just supports us in that work. So I think really as a final thought, um, we're kind of in the middle of this process. We've got three or four sites on site now. It's not many. We've got an awful lot that are going to start on site in the next year and a half. And a lot of this for my team is about seeing how we've responded to this stuff in the past, trying to take our development managers out to see things that are on site now and trying to build that knowledge internally. It's kind of my hunch that if we really love this process, if we take it right from conception through to years after completion, and we get as much right as we can, if we focus on the areas where we feel like we can make a difference, then in a way, it's trying to mitigate that too fast um, as much as possible. And with luck, it also makes sure we provide just the right amount. But that's a hypothesis. Um, yeah, thank you.
Thank you very much. My name is Shukriya Sudhakar. I head the regeneration team at Tire Hamlets. And it was very interesting hearing Tom talk about intelligent client and somebody who's passionate and committed. I really wish that I could say about all the clients that we deal with as a council every day. That would be amazing. But what I would like to share today with you is how, as a local authority, we, sitting at the other end of regulatory process, how do we manage growth in a borough that's very dense and is also having one of the highest housing targets. And as Kat said early on, that San Francisco is different from London, different from Paris, Hong Kong. We could actually say that we have all of those cities in the borough in just different places. And it is that context that we are trying to provide you as a background. So for those, you know, most of you are familiar with Tower Hamlets. It's an inner London borough, one of the smallest inner London boroughs with a very, very high levels of housing target. And closer. Okay. Apologies. One of the smallest inner London boroughs, but also has very high levels of housing targets. And what you see as the blobs within that diagram is all the really distinctive places that some of you may be familiar with. And this is the kind of the 24 places that the local plan tries and captures. Obviously, in the real world, these are not just defined in any boundaries and their overlaps, but they are just kind of there to say that these are distinct places. And a, a place that is also very rich in its cultural history and built history, and we have an elected mayor, and it's also a borough with high levels of deprivation, contrasting with also high, very high levels of growth and economic activity. So that's the borough of, uh, as you say, at the epicenter of all of these changes. And in terms of the growth itself, as I said, 2004 London plan, we were the highest growth housing target borough, around just around just over 2,000 homes. And the new current London plan has almost doubled that. So between 2004 and now, we've seen our targets go higher and higher. Only in the new London plan, we are the second after Newham. But what it tells you is, in the last 10, 15 years of time, that's the kind of the challenge of the borough having to deliver that level of growth. And as you, Tom said, it's not just housing, it's everything else that supports and sustains places. And what is important to also observe is it's not a blank canvas. It's already a very established inner London part. One third of the borough is conservation areas. That doesn't mean that you can't build anything, but the level of sensitivity with which you have to manage that change is enormous. One fourth of the borough is open space and water space, not something that you build on. And we also have a large proportion of industrial land. So within this context, you're trying to fit in all of the demands of housing, infrastructure, and everything. That makes it the most exciting place to work, but also most challenging. And we are having to kind of think on of it every day, because there are no answers out there that we can just simply use. And this comes down to the importance of having a good client. And as a local authority, you have a range of clients with different expectations. 2010, the current local plan that we adopted had a very different type of geography, just says broadly our focus was, okay, we have town centers which also have high levels of PTEL, so we can densify in those locations. We also had in the purple bit, it's not very clear, more towards the east, and then Canary Wharf and City for in some locations where we said there's potential for regeneration in those areas and therefore potential for newer homes. That is 2010, where things are much more amorphous without specifically saying how much and where. Come now, it's the new local plan. We not only know how much we need to build, but also where exactly we need to build those. A very different to 10 years ago, what we had. And those boundaries broadly set out that in the whole the local plan, we have four distinct areas. Three of those areas come from London plan designation. So to the west is City Fringe, to the south is Isle of Dogs and South Poplar, and to the east is Loverly Valley. And the table there demonstrates how much of proportion of that emerging growth is actually going to be fit into specific areas. So clearly to the south, as you can see in Isle of Dogs, South Poplar, you have a huge proportion of the housing growth concentrated. And that was also the place where we do have sites available for growth. And if you overlay that to just numbers, that gives you a sense of the change that's taking place in those areas. What's important to observe is those areas are also very different in their character. To the west, you have really rich heritage. You have the Tower of London. You have 
kind of a huge numbers of listed buildings. To the center of the borough, you have most of the Victorian domestic housing stock and parks and open space. To the east, you have what is used to be the predominantly industrial bit, which is now transforming to become a place that people want to inhabit. But that requires a lot of inward investment and also proactive planning. To the south, which is Isle of Dogs, South Poplar, which is south of Kennedy Wharf, you have already seen a number of taller buildings, but you're seeing a lot more of them come forward. And those darker shaded bounded uh, zones are the ones where we, have, we will see a high proportion of housing coming forward. That's what in the local, in the local plan we call a site allocation, where we would expect to have those big infrastructure. Just to kind of give you what those areas are and how they are changing, that's just visually saying, what's the kind of typology that you see in those broadly? What I would like to point, bring to your attention is how we have seen in the last 10, 15, 20 years, actually, the way the densities have changed, as you can see in that graph, We've had maybe a few high-dense buildings, but then from 20, 2007, 8, you have a patch where you're seeing more of them emerging. But then 2012 onwards, it's an upshoot completely. And if you link it to also taller buildings, sorry, the first one refers to the height and the second one to the density, you see a real correlation. And those dates also kind of start to say, why is it 2012 you're seeing this? And what happened after 2007? You know, we all know things that have happened during that time with the recession and everything. But what is more important from our point of view is to look at what policy evolution has happened during that period. So 2004 saw the new London plan, but then also to 2012, the NPPF, the housing SPG, and we see a shift from a quantitative approach to how we measure and look at issues with density to more and more a very qualitative approach to looking at density. So the new London plan is clearly about we have seen the PTAL removed, but we also are seeing more and more the importance placed on good design and qualitative. But it's one of the also the good things and also the challenging bit is how do you then explain what is good design in a very different context where we haven't had that much of experience of understanding what is it like to live in them and how you formulate it. And this is the 2019 New London Architecture Study about tall buildings. How many are in the pipeline? How many have been being under construction? And how many are being planned? What is interesting to observe is the Tower Hamlets, of course, comes up quite high for the reasons I set out. But equally important is to see the red bits, which are the ones which are permissions in that. And that's across most of the boroughs. So it's not just a case of one borough. It may be now us, but in future, this is something that is going to become the norm in many places. And they're, of course, for and against this, and often people relate density directly to height, and we need to be able to kind of say that there are two different things, and the importance of trying to understand the issues in each one separately to actually understand what it means to join jointly. So there are for and against, and most of the conventional things would be out of context. They're all relevant and important, but again, it's an important thing now is to engage with that conversation and if we are in this position where we are going to see taller buildings being built, we no longer in the luxury of saying we don't want tall buildings, but it's actually engaging. What are the issues after a certain point? How do we engage with it? How do you design them? Well, if it is possible at all to design high-density neighborhoods. So that conversation is what we are interested in. And which kind of goes to explain. The, the diagram that you see on the right-hand side is what we have traditionally used when we are discussing about density. And that is 75 units per hectare. And we could say, yes, this is the density. We can have it in different forms. And wouldn't it be nice to have two-story houses rather than have a big tower? But the challenge we are now dealing with is five times, six times that density. So that matrix and those three diagrams that you have to say, yes, we can accommodate in this, is no longer the way forward. And that's important because as a borough, having reflected on the last 10 years of how we've managed the process, these are some of the reflections that is kind of going to lead us to the next stage of the presentation. Firstly, dense growth doesn't mean that it's always tall, and it is about density in different forms that needs to be carefully managed. And that could be about mansard roof extensions or additions to existing housing stock, and how, how well we do it and how we address the challenges that come with also under over-occupation, et cetera. Second thing is the most important bit that we're missing is the feedback loop from lived experience to inform policy. 
and that is an important part of helping us to shape the guidance on these. Second, third element is the tools that we still use for assessing these schemes are quite rudimentary, so we're still using the same design policies that you would assess a six to 10 story buildings under tall building policy to when you apply to a 60 story building. Equally, how would you assess a tall building that's an office one different to a residential to a mixed tenure. And these are some of the discussions that's been played out as the London Plan Examination and at various forms. In my personal view, this is something that needs to go a long way to help us actually create places that we want to live in. High density neighborhoods is also not a, just a collection of tall buildings and high density buildings. It is important that we recognize that Hong Kong is a place different from just a group of tall buildings. And if you are actually creating more of these, it's important to know what makes a neighborhood that is tall and how does the different uses work. You can't just have a traditional shop thing working. So it's how we think about them as vertical neighborhoods. And an impact-based assessment of density, or even for that matter, tall building, is not going to be an answer. So what are the new tools do we need to, that we need to think about? And the last element is the research that we would like to share with you and where we are looking at lived experience in tall buildings and how helping to shape policy. So as Shiri just mentioned, um, uh, I joined the local authority 18 months ago to look at this particular issue uh, that is um, how can we accommodate high good quality high density in the borough. So basically, I think this sits in the context of the new London plan where they say that um, across all sides we need to be optimizing density and that good design can uh, mitigate against some of these, um, some of the uh, negative impacts. So I think the first question for us was uh, what good design means. And I think for us, um, uh, what we decided is that for good quality needs to support a resident's uh, quality of life. And we also sort of, uh, try to address the issue about transparency. So if now the discussions uh, around density are gonna be around a uh, good quality, that's quite a subjective uh, uh, element. And so trying to bring transparency and bring all the stakeholders to the table uh, through the research, we've been trying to have these conversations and uh, get to um, an agreement uh, about what do we mean uh, but good design, about with good design. So I think, what we are trying to do with this project is to respond to a really high density. So if that's the current or the previous uh, London density metrics, what we are looking at is densities that go way above uh, the maximum one. So if the maximum was 1,100 habitable rooms per hectare, some of the densities that we are dealing with are uh, around uh, 5,000 habitable rooms per hectare. So for us, it was, as Shri mentioned, very important to gather evidence uh, to support this new policy. So we selected a series of case studies across the borough uh, that are relatively new. So all of them were approved uh, uh, in the last uh, 10 years and um, also that were established enough, so at least built for, the la for two years, to make sure that the responses we got from residents were meaningful. So to choose those uh, case studies. We developed a framework. Basically, we looked at different densities, so from 1,000 habitable rooms per hectare to up to 2,000, and also buildings of different height. And when selecting those, we were also trying to bring a, or incorporate a different building typologies. So we were trying to acknowledge that, yes, density can be accommodated in different ways, and that some of the challenges that you might find in a standalone tower are very different from the challenge that you might find in a podium uh, block. But also we were paying uh, attention to tenure. So we have schemes that are fully private, also schemes that are fully affordable and, and mixes in between. Because we think that, again, some of the challenges and complexities are very context specific. So the engagement that we undertook was, a, was I think, very thorough. So we tried to engage with uh, a lot of residents, but also making sure that we were talking to the f residents from different um, parts of the building, so from the affordable, the private, people living on the lower uh, parts of the building, higher up, uh, living in different flat types. And so we engage with them through surveys, so we have quantitative data uh, that has been very useful, but we also 
uh, interview them to go into more detail about some of the issues that arise from the survey. And um, I think one element well, that was quite interesting was to do site visits with caretakers. So those working and managing these places on an everyday basis uh, have a very detailed knowledge of how through design we can mitigate some of the incredibly difficult challenges that they face uh, on an everyday basis. And then, so we developed the, the guidance, the new document, uh, in conversations with different stakeholders, so trying to make sure that we were incorporating all the knowledge that you know, services within the council and different uh, industry experts uh, have. And so the outputs are three. So we will be publishing the results of the case studies and we are providing, uh, we are producing a new uh, housing design guideline for high density, but we are also developing planning recommendations for the process. So we have identified moments in the, in the planning process where there needs to be a particular uh, emphasis or care to make sure that we are sort of locking key elements to make sure that schemes are delivered as intended. And now I'm just gonna give like a brief sort of summary of some of the data that we found through the, through the research uh, that we found that was uh, quite interesting. So basically, we structure the, the guidance or through the conversations with residents and stakeholders. Five elements were considered key to deliver a good quality places. So how children and young people um, live in these, in these spaces uh, is something that is quite challenging and important to address. How do we provide the spaces or buildings that a, 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 a secure a social cohesion, so how do we make sure that mixed and balanced communities um, are able to, to live in here. Everyday life, so in, I think in these environments, uh, elements that are not problematic or challenging in other environments become really uh, difficult. Um, so for example, uh, working from home and different kind of works, but also washing and drying your clothes becomes something that is uh, quite difficult in small flats. And then in the fourth one, buildings as systems is about bringing circularity and how these buildings can be more sustainable. So consumptions of water are really high. So how can we, compare to any other type, how can we improve that? And the final one is about like, uh, how do we provide healthy uh, spaces? So basically access to daylight sunlight uh, and how can we mitigate against um, pollution or uh, overheat? So when we ask about a, uh, about, about the who in these buildings um, had children, so the number of families living there, the response quite was 34%, um, so quite high. And it depends on the tenure. But what I think was really key is that most of these families do not live in family homes. So most families live in studio flats, one beds, and two beds. So 64% of them live in, in, in spaces that are not designed for families. Um, another important element was to understand how children play, and 82% of families say that children play, do not play unsupervised, and that's a big issue because we know that for the healthy development of a child, unsupervised play is key. So through the design guidelines, we are trying to make sure that play is integrated, uh, is not uh, isolated, so at the moment play happens uh, on a very defined space. So how can we design buildings that are playable, so throughout the scheme, but also how can we make one beds and two beds a also, or how can we provide a additional spaces to make their life easier? Then if we move to mix and balance communities, I think the, the community feel in the building is really low. I think it's interesting to see how it relates to tenure, income, um, and ethnicity. So it's interesting to see that a, owners are the ones that feel uh, that there is a less community feel in the building as opposed uh, to a social rent or a private rent. And I think the use of communal spaces is, is quite low and the interaction between neighbors in those places is very low. So it's looking at how can we provide these spaces and how can we design them in places that uh, are easier for residents to, ac to access, um, but also provide opportunities for them to interact. And I think it's also interesting not just to look at the building, but the building in relationship to the wider neighborhood. And I think it was shocking to see that most people living around high density do not know the residents within the, the building. 
but more importantly, um, they don't feel they are part of the community. So there is a big gap uh, that we need to bridge. And I think if you look at the different case studies, the differences are stark. So while in this one, for example, in particular, 92% of the people perceive these residents are part of the community, and this may have to do with the way the building is designed on the ground floor or having a community center in the heart of the development. In this one, 80% of the residents living around the scheme felt that they are not part of the community. And this is a big issue because, for example, this scheme is 800 units, so it's a big part of, of the community that's not integrated. And then in everyday life, I think it's the challenges around understanding that there are different activities. It's not just desktop sort of work, what happens in these environments, and how can we, through design interventions, reduce isolation and also try to bring uh, residents uh, together by sort of understanding what services some of their neighbors are providing, um, and I think the last one is around uh, so trying to bring to the, to the fore, like there are activities on an everyday basis like washing and drying that are not included currently in any housing SPG. But, you know, uh, we've seen when visiting flats that they hang their clothes in the middle of the living room. That creates lots of issues around uh, damp and humidity, but also the use of the space. So I think this sort of like invisible invisibilized elements needs to be brought forward. And I think, yeah, that's it. So basically, we are starting consultation on this in February, and I think answering the question of too much, too fast, I think the housing target is there. We need to respond to it. I think what we are trying to say is that we need to know better uh, we, about how these places are lived uh, and experienced uh, to make sure that we do uh, the best work we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for some uh, fascinating uh, presentations already. I think this will speak really nicely to what you've already said, pointing on some of the same uh, kind of conclusions, but maybe thinking about it slightly different. Uh, as you mentioned, Kat, I'm a cultural geographer, uh, so I might approach the whole sort of uh, debate around uh, density uh, in a different way, um, but I think that will sort of uh, come out um, pretty obviously. Um, I, uh, I want to spend uh, the next 10 minutes talking about what kind of knowledge underpins decision making in urban planning and design making, uh, in design uh, processes, specifically in relation to high rise buildings. Uh, and I want to think about the, ty the types of knowledge that underpin decision making uh, processes, but also the types of knowledge that are left out. Um, and of course, think critically about what then should be address what should be introduced, what should be included. Uh, and it sort of emerges as one strand out of my wider sort of program of research around high-rise buildings, where I'm looking at particularly in East London how the recent surge in high-rise buildings, residential high-rises, are impacting not just on their surroundings, but on people's ability to form meaningful attachments to places. So how do people throughout everyday life come to live uh, in high-rises in ways that are meaningful to them? How do they come to develop a sense of home and a sense of belonging through the built form? And I'm specifically interested in doing that, doing that by looking at the way that uh, people inhabit high rises at night. So I introduce lighting as kind of like an analytical category for exploring how people form attachments to the surrounding city, but particularly to the domestic sphere at night. How do people write their home to feel at home in particular ways? Uh, so when asked to address this uh, sort of provocation too much too fast uh, in relation to the decision making process of urban planning, I thought it was helpful to think about how buildings come to be what they are. And of course, 
for those of you who have an architectural planning background, this will be uh, quite obvious. Uh, but when a developer comes forward with a proposal, it will be scrutinized on a number of uh, parameters in order to ensure that the development, in order to get approval, of course, is policy compliant, that it meets certain goals, that delivers in certain uh, aspects. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, in relation to ensure that it uh, provides a sustainable way for uh, developing communities in, in the future, and ensuring that uh, there's a basic infrastructure to support that within urban development, of course, support that rise in, in footfall, demand on infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure, uh, shopping, and whatever it might be. In relation to the aesthetic quality of the building, of course, it also goes through a number of tests uh, in order to ensure that it adheres to a certain sort of uh, local aesthetic. There's mention of uh, different kinds of, of heritage areas that, of course, requires uh, of the designers to be sensitive towards context. So that sort of, of course, is also a very important aspect. But one of the things that is uh, interestingly left out or where uh, local town planners have little uh, guidance to go to is how the uh, building appears at night and how to assess, critically assess, the appearance of the building at night. Uh, and particularly, that is, of course, in relation to the way it's lit, the way that it comes to appear luminously as this one through the domestic lighting, but specifically also the lighting technologies within the home. Where are they placed? What kinds of technology is introduced? Where power sockets placed? And how is that supposed to uh, form better living environments? That sort of knowledge is not something you can necessarily expect from an architect or a uh, urban planner. Uh, working in local councils to have sort of uh, um, on the fingertips right away, and there's no real sort of guidance out there um, to help them uh, assess buildings in accordance to that. So what they often rely on is these kind of like spectacular CGIs. Uh, that not just show what the building looks like, but of course aims at giving us a feeling of what it might be uh, to, to spend time in that space, getting at some of the sort of uh, tangibility of, of uh, experiencing the space. Um, and that's of course in accordance with the uh, kind of uh, uh, faith that uh, the um, uh, town planners and architects have in the um, design team uh, adhering to certain standards that we know assure quality across space, so living up to certain uh, minimum requirements for lighting, ensuring that there's not overlooking, ensuring there's not glare, that we avoid using outdated technologies, that we use the best quality technology, and so on and so forth. Recommendations for how to create uh, good environments. But one of my problems with that, the reliance on standards uh, and the reliance on, on CGIs, is that it's, on the one hand, a sort of aesthetic purely visual judgment. This looks nice. This is something that I think looks nice. And of course, urban planners, architects are experts, but it becomes a very sort of subjective judgment. Uh, on the other hand, standards, of course, they are purely technical measures and they're numerical measures that try to quantify uh, stuff that maybe is m less easily quantifiable. Um, and it doesn't necessarily capture, as you mentioned, the lived experience, what it's like to be in this space. So that's sort of one of the things that I wanted to kind of like draw out. Help to assess buildings according to the lived experience is less uh, available in the planning and design process. Um, yeah. So when thinking about uh, too much too fast, uh, I think that of course we should be concerned and, and yeah, maybe sort of, as you correctly said, Tom, too much, maybe not because there's a need somewhere um, but what I would sort of suggest is that we need to maybe turn attention away from the sort of scale and the speed of what is happening and try to think about ways that we could equip uh, decision makers with the right types of knowledge to then actually assess the buildings that come through uh, pre-app and planning uh, processes. And that's sort of, of course, a call to think with Foucault a bit that power is knowledge, that it depends on what kind of knowledge then gets to uh, sort of way in the uh, assessment of buildings. Um, and this is where sort of, uh, I then want to turn to, to some of uh, the research that I'm doing, interviewing residents that live in new builds and that constantly uh, draw out the uh, problems and the uh, irritations they have on a day-to-day -day level with the kind of pre-installed lighting that come with flats 
which is the lighting that lives up to and absolutely uh, um, uh, meets the policy requirements, uh, sort of meets standards, it is the sort of energy efficient lighting, and it's supposed to be sort of well designed, right? Um, so this is one particular uh, resident who, uh, in her bedroom and in the living room and kitchen, uh, doesn't use any of the pre-installed lighting in the ceilings because it's, uh, uh, it doesn't give the kind of feeling that she searches for. In the bedroom, she absolutely uh, she, never, she doesn't use this particular standard ceiling lamp only when she can't find stuff uh, like deep in, uh, hidden deep inside the cupboards. So she's bought this kind of like a decorative lampshade to hide the, uh, the, the light, right? Um, so she only put it on for my sake. As we move into her sort of living room, again, the, the sort of uh, ceiling lights are on only to sort of demonstrate that she never uses them because it doesn't give her the right feeling uh, in her home. So what she then does instead is she relies on the kitchen light kind of bleeding into the space where these lights do fit her sort of domestic practices in, is in spaces like hallways and cupboards where the brightness is absolutely conducive to what she uses them for. So what I'm trying to draw out is that these lights are sort of state-of-the-art energy-efficient lights, LEDs that um, meet all the standardized requirements and so forth, but they're not conducive towards the kind of uh, experience that she wants in her home, or at least it's not differentiated enough. A very similar type of flat, but a bit more high-end, and with a much more advanced lighting system, um, where it's modulated, it's dimmable. Um, the resident had a similar sort of uh, experience. He doesn't like it, so he doesn't use it. He never puts it on. But this is more the quality, the feel of the light, something that you can't necessarily put a measure on. Um, and it's something that the debates we might be quite familiar with in, in public media, how these uh, sort of energy efficient light bulbs and particular LEDs feel differently. So he never uses these lights, even though that they can actually be dimmed in evenings. And so it's not a question of light levels or brightness, it's the quality that it actually uh, produces. And of course, one of the ridiculous examples, his bedroom, the sort of main master bedroom has these spotlights above. Who would ever place them there? Who would want to have spotlights in, in a bedroom? at least not when you're sleeping. So it, in a sense, sort of what he sort of pointed out was these are lights that are extremely expensive that if I have to take them away, of course it would be an expensive process, and I never use them. Something uh, went wrong there. So to round off, sort of what I'm sort of trying to uh, sort of point at is that somewhere in this process something has gone wrong. These developments come with presumably state-of-the-art lighting, but it's not conducive towards environments that make these people at home, so they just tend not to use the lighting, use other stuff instead. And I think that sort of might be something where uh, we could point towards the types of knowledge that inform the decision-making processes in order to make uh, better decisions. And that's sort of what I would like to say. Thank you. Um, my question is about adaptability and what it's going to understand 
maybe there's 30 percent of this space. I mean, the people on the water are not dolphins. They're somewhere else. So it is already extremely dense. And just the way you think you get the, the house, the people are already living effectively, you know, the crowd is there, places that you can just drive. So in one studio room with kids and, and, and stuff like that, where you do the washing and all these issues. So I think that my, my issue there is how far can you go? How much more people can you cram in this place? Do they make human? I mean, for me, this is a really issue. Do they all have to be in the Tower Hamlets? They're all there. They're all, you know, if you look at the other Tower Bobs uh, up in the Atlantic, it's come out of like 600 planes, 600 planning commissions going up eight years ago, of course. Uh, so, so, and the densifying everywhere, and the, the, about the, the, that's what no can hold. So I think your, your exercise would, would be, what would that be interesting if you have a control group in Tower Hamlets of the people who are living in those interwar council flats, for example, they can't be there too long, uh, who are there for everybody else. And to say, well, okay, what do they think? They don't live in the ideal conditions, far from it. I mean, there is really a lot of problems there also with, with uh, humidity and, and, and growth stuff, top notch, as you can imagine. Anyway, just to see in terms of how do they use their space, you know, and is it bigger? And what, what's the square area per head? We're talking about in these, in these new protests. Yes, so that's how it's looking. Do you consider having a control group uh, <coughs> that, you know, I think that would be pretty hard to see physically in this space, I'm sure. So we are there. don't really meet the needs, meet the needs of the people uh, that are going to occupy them. So surely as property value should be, re land value should be residual, it should be driven by planning frameworks uh, rather than driving them. Shouldn't the local authorities be questioning whether they're getting a good value for money and some satisfaction for people? I, I see today in the papers that they have the most miserable children in the world. That's even before they end up <laughs> in places like uh, so if one started again and said, well, why don't we just try and make people a little happier? Why don't we try and cut costs of the development, probably by doing four and five story uh, housing as they do in Germany, for example? Um, we might find that we actually produce a much better neighborhood in which people, uh, you know, less likely to go and do homelessness.
obvious, not really reliable.
Sorry, the, uh, I'll, I'll call stop to the formal um, event. Please do carry on.